Hey guys, welcome back to the show. We have a great episode for you today. Um, another great guest. Let's talk about our episode. Have you spent years trying to better your health with fad diets or expensive supplements and getting nowhere? If you're struggling with unexplained symptoms or cannot find an answer to ongoing health problems, I truly understand and know that it can be disheartening and overwhelming. And in this episode of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance, we're going to try to simplify for you with guest Katie Wells. We discuss the four pillars of health and the importance of taking a step back, basically stripping all the health routines down to the basics. Katie shows us that this route can be refreshing and often a way to overcome all the overwhelming data that is thrown into the health and wellness space. Focusing on the four pillars of health can alleviate stress and give you a clear picture of what is, what's causing the health issues in the first place. Think of it kind of like as pulling the puzzle apart a bit and starting over. We also dive into the data behind the blue, zone, blue zones and the controversy behind them. Overall, this episode can offer you information on the importance of community and how it has an impact on longevity and health. And that getting back to the basics is a really important place to start when looking for answers. I met Katie Wells at an event last November and immediately connected with her. She's a mom of six with a background in journalism. She took her health into her own hands and started researching to find answers to her own really serious health struggles. Her research turned into a blog and a podcast that turned into an amazing community, as well as a resource to help thousands of others. Katie Wells, the Wellness Mama, encourages a natural, simple route to finding health and longevity for each individual. Now, to learn more about her, you can go to her website, wellnessmama.com. On Instagram, she's Wellness Mama, and she's got beautiful personal care, care products at mywellnesswithane.com. Hey, folks, just a quick reminder that all of the information presented in this podcast is for information purposes only. No medical advice, no diagnosing, no treatments suggested here. Before you try anything that you hear about or learn about here, make sure that you check with your medical provider. Welcome to the show, Katie Wells. I am so thrilled to have you here today. Oh, I'm so excited for our conversation and thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. I mean, it's funny. You've been, you've been, I, I've had awareness of you for so long, as do many people, because you do have such a beautiful presence in the health space. Um, and it's always been a, Hmm, I wonder how I would ever approach Katie Wells and blah, blah, blah. And then we were both at an event in November and uh, got to spend a little bit of time chatting and talking. And so it's always, I love that organic way of connecting with someone and then having them on a podcast. I mean, obviously reaching out to people and inviting them cold is great, but I think this was a really nice and appropriate way for us to connect and have this conversation. So I'm really excited. Um, Katie, why don't... Um, I mean, you've, you've, you know, you're in, in many ways, I think of you as one of the people that's, that's in many ways kind of laid the terrain of this wellness space in some, in, in many different ways. And maybe do you, do you want to talk about it? Because you have such a huge body of work from the podcast to books and articles, like you started off as a journalist. Am I right? I did. Yeah. Yeah. And it was actually never the original plan to get into health and wellness and nutrition. It was, I think for many of us, a byproduct of searching for our own answers and mm -hmm. then realizing there was more to the story. But the short version is around the time I had my first son, I also started having some weird health issues. And I read at my six week follow-up visit with him at the doctor in a magazine while I was waiting for the doctor that for the first time in two centuries, the current generation of American children would have a shorter life expectancy than their parents. And that statistic really hit me because I was holding this perfect newborn and reading about the skyrocketing rates of all of the chronic diseases and heart disease and cancer and autoimmune disease and diabetes. And I knew I didn't want that for him and I didn't want that for anybody's child. And at the same time, began my path of having unexplained health symptoms that for years I was told by doctors were either normal or that it was all in my head or that everything mm -hmm. was fine or that's part of being a woman or that happens postpartum. And I'm really grateful actually for that time period because the journalism had taught me to sort of turn to my own research to find mm -hmm. the other side of the story. And I realized slowly and very foundationally with doctors is no one's coming to save us. We can work with doctors. They, they can be amazing partners. But that really helped solidify something I say so often, which is that we are each our own primary healthcare provider. 
even if we work with amazing practitioners, we're mm-hmm. the actual provider. We're the ones making the daily choices. We're the ones building our habits. And we have the best data about ourselves because we exist in our own bodies. And yes, it's an end of one study, but for us individually, that is the most powerful study we will ever see. And so that's been part of the awareness that grew over all those years. And that now I try to say often is like, you're not going to get the exact answers word for word from anyone else. All these experts are amazing and they have found their path and there's wisdom in their path. But at the end of the day, it's you finding yours and you doing your own end of one experimentation that actually really yields the best results. And I learned that lesson the hard way through at least eight doctors and almost a decade before figuring out from on my own, using the wisdom of so many people, how to get better. Yeah, I love that. And and it's so true, you know, and I, I think what's hard for people when they're when they're very ill is you so desperately want to find that one person who's going to say, put their arms around you and say, I got you. I have the answer. And, you know, every once in a while it happens, you land on the right practitioner, but I think any good doctor slash practitioner in any of the spaces will say that it's, it's, it's a team effort. It's, it's joint work. It's not, it's not a passive exercise. Absolutely. And certainly not to diminish that experience that so many people had and that I had, because I remember being so fatigued that I slept in front of the door to my house. So my toddlers couldn't go run in traffic because I was so tired. I couldn't stay awake. And I remember being 80 pounds heavier and how harder, how much harder everything felt. And so I I very much remember that feeling. And my heart goes out to those people who are in that place because I remember all too well how it feels. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And also to your point, that's also a great reminder that not everything has to change in a lightning bolt overnight. Mm -hmm. That thankfully, little steps over time slowly give you more energy and they slowly give you more focus and better sleep. And that compounds and builds in a positive feedback loop. And so give yourself a little grace if you are in that hard spot. Don't expect to change everything in your life overnight because that's going to make it so much more stressful. Yeah, no, it's such a good point. And so you know, your the wellness mama has such a beautiful aura to it, right? That's the name of your podcast. It's it's and it, and it and it is and it does and it embodies you and your spirit. Like you're, you know, when people meet at least when I met you, I just felt like this sense of kind of calm and warmth, just being in your presence, and and that it's a gift, right? To be able to 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 create that space for yourself. Probably most, I'm sure, for your family, and then and then for the people who kind of move into your sphere professionally, and so I think that in that you bring this beautiful perspective into the space. And so this podcast is, you know, it's a biohacking podcast. We talk a lot about longevity, and we talk about technology and supplements and all the things. And every once in a while, I think it's so important for us to take a breath, slow down stop a little bit and then hear hear and embody other the the other face of wellness right the other face of whether it's healing or maintaining our balance in the space and and i think that you're probably one of the best people to kind of bring breathe some life into that concept for the audience because as you said before we even started recording and i really believe you know, all the the tech and the supplements, like they have a place at different times for different people it, to different degrees. But if we're able to tap into what you call the four pillars, and we added a fifth, which we were thinking we could slide into one of the four, you can talk about that. Um, everything else is going to get easier. And all those other interventions might work better and faster. So I'm going to turn the mic over to you and let you kind of lean into those pillars and starting points. Well, first of all, thank you. That was a tremendous compliment and you gave me chills. So thank you for saying that. And I'll do a high level of what I call the four pillars and then we can go deeper in any of them that you want. But these came from really realizing, I think in so many voices in the health world, it can get really overwhelming and confusing and we can get caught up in like, do I need one specific nutrient or do I need this one specific thing? And the answer is going to be different for all of us. But what I realized is there are universal human commonalities that you can at least start from. And then when you start from those, it's, it becomes easier to really analyze using how you feel and the data on your own body, what you might need to build beyond that. And that when we get the pillars right, anything that we might do that is more advanced or specific or expensive is going to work better 
So if you're going to invest the time and the money into supplements or biohacking or labs or whatever the things are, if you can build a foundation first, it'll be better um, value for your money for what you're spending and trying to get better. Because I spent a lot of money and wasted it over the years before I started doing these things consistently. And, and the four that I would say as that I think of as the four pillars, the first is light. The second is movement, which there's some caveats there. Then nutrients, which is where we would say that we would put community, because I believe also humans are nutrients and relationships are nutrients, and they're actually some of the best medicine we can have. And then sleep. And the cool thing about these is I don't know of any expert who would argue directly with the concept of any of them. I don't know any expert who would say we don't need to get sunlight, we don't need to get sleep, we don't need to have relationships or eat nutrients. But there is a lot of individuality within those pillars. And what I realized was there was kind of an 80-20, which for people who aren't familiar with that principle, I use it a lot in my life, which is that often 80% of our results come from 20% of our inputs. Mm -hmm. And I realized that within each of these pillars, there were some core things we could do that would have a big result. And then we could tweak beyond that if we wanted to get more granular. So when it comes to light, the guidelines I have for myself is that the, the, the light at different times of day impacts our biology differently. The cool thing is going outside is free. The other cool mm -hmm. thing is even on a cloudy day, it's extremely beneficial, much more beneficial and more broad spectrum light than you're getting from indoor light. So this can be as simple as as soon as possible after waking up, get outside. And for me, this looks like literally rolling out of bed and walking outside with a glass of water with some minerals in it. Nice. First thing I do, <laughs> and I have the rule of sunlight before screens. Mm -hmm. And people always ask, what if I get up before the sun? Then just go outside when the sun rises. You don't have to go stand in the dark outside, go out when the sun rises. And the cool thing with that is that actually begins your circadian clock for how well you're going to produce melatonin at night. So that's one little implemented habit that makes a huge difference on your sleep, which we'll get to in a few minutes. And it's free. And if you stack it with hydration or a little bit of gentle movement, you've now integrated a really solid habit early in the morning. Midday sun is its own category. And that's where we get things like vitamin D, which I know sunlight in midday can be controversial. But mm -hmm. that triggers also light receptors in our eyes. So it's yeah. reinforcing our sleep patterns and circadian rhythm. And it's so much more than just vitamin D. Vitamin D, yes, because we know that reduces risk of a lot of the major chronic diseases. But that broad spectrum light also impacts the mitochondria. It also impacts neurotransmitters. It also impacts our gut. It's much more far reaching than just vitamin D. And so if we're just taking a supplement of vitamin D and avoiding the sun for fear of the sun, we're missing out on all those other benefits. And then the third, I would say, would be sunset or even mm -hmm. moonlight at times, but sunset, because that is nature's red light. You know, we hear of all these fancy red light devices. Nature gives it to us every sunrise and sunset, and it's free. And I'm not saying red light's bad. I have them in my house, but also get them from nature too. You know, there's a lot of experts that are saying we're sort of having nature deficiency disorder. Yeah. And when we look at things like the camping study that showed drastic changes in hormones and circadian rhythm from less than a week of camping outside, mm -hmm. we realize how disconnected we are from nature. So start with nature. It's free. You can go outside. The second would be movement. And I think in the modern world, we've done ourselves a disservice by shifting from movement to exercise mm -hmm. and thinking of exercise as the category because humans were meant to move. And I'm not saying don't exercise in a specific way, but move like a human all the time. And so this can be done in several ways. It can be an easy habit to implement as well. We've probably all heard about walking being beneficial and the sources argue over how many steps and how much benefit, but they all seem to agree that walking is good for us. So try to go for a walk, maybe do it during the morning sunlight if you want to save time, but get movement in every day and also put things in your way that help you get natural human movements without having to drive to the gym or expend effort to move. So in my house, we have gymnastics rings hanging in the house. We have a climbing hangboard in the kitchen. Nice. We just put things <laughs> in our way that get used. And I think what I kind of try to put in category based on the data is like, get that walking, get some zone two. We've all heard about the studies related to that and make sure you're building lean muscle mass. However, you're going to do that. That usually involves some sort of resistance and strength training, but that is incredibly correlated to longevity. And Dr. Gabrielle Lyon calls muscle the organ of longevity and says it's actually our biggest muscle or, um, organ, not our skin. And we know from the data, the stronger you are, the more lean muscle mass you have as you age, on average, the longer you will live, and it will reduce your risk of all-cause mortality and other health issues. Yeah. And so I think when we just spoke on like the high-intensity cardio classes, we're missing zone two and we're missing 
lean muscle mass building activities. And so I've actually sort of 80, 20 into really just focusing on those and then mm-hmm. getting the rest is ambient movement with my kids. Now, nutrients, again, mostly commonly related to food. I would say also humans are nutrients. So this mm-hmm. relates directly to the quality of our relationships. This is another area where I feel like the modern conversation does us a disservice because we all hear about calories and macros and those things can be useful tools, but they don't take into account the nutrient density of the food that mm-hmm. we're eating. And I think we would see much better results if we shifted our metric to be nutrient density per volume of food being eaten instead of calories or macros. Because in America, especially, we are often overfed and undernourished. And I really wonder if part of the reason we see so much obesity and have so many cravings, that's not a mistake. Our body craves things because it needs things. Mm -hmm. So if our body needs nutrients, we're going to crave whatever food it can think of to get us to try to get more nutrients. Whereas if we focus on nutrient density, then we're actually getting those nutrient needs. We won't have as much desire for just food because we're actually meeting the nutrient needs of being a human. And then lastly would be sleep. And this one I feel like is relatively self-explanatory because in almost 800 podcast episodes, I've never had a single person say sleep is not important or it doesn't matter. (laughs) This one is universal, whether someone is vegan or carnivore or keto or whatever, they all agree sleep is important. And statistically, we're not getting great quality sleep anymore. And this can, you know, people talk about artificial light, about EMFs, about all of the things we're exposed to, about eating too close to bed. And I think those are all important, but I think sleep especially is a category where some self-experimentation can help a lot. And yes, sleeping in a dark room, the right temperature, having a nighttime routine, avoiding lights after sunset, not eating right before bed, those are kind of universally helpful, but because there is a hormone component here and there is a neurotransmitter component here, and there is a did you move during the day component here, there does, there's some experimentation required. But as you find what works for you, integrate those habits because sleep will make everything else you're doing in the other categories pay dividends much more quickly. A hundred percent. I love everything that you just said. I've, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it, I mean, there, and, and, you know, people, I think that what happens is, and even when people come out of balance and they're dealing with an illness or they get deep into the, the biohacking, I think it pays to periodically do a check-in on those four pillars, pillars, because sometimes we fall out of sync, even though we start off focusing on them, you start to move into more focused work in one area or another, or you're, you know, you've got, you're dealing with mold or whatever the case may be. And you become so hyper-focused on this one specific thing that sometimes it's easy to fall out of sync on one of these pillars. And, and so it's an, it's important for all of us to always do a check-in and come back. And and one of the ways I think that maybe, and I don't know how you feel about this because it, it can be a bit of a double-edged sword, but keeping some kind of, of a diary or a journal or using an app, this is where technology can kind of come in handy. This is where the wearables sometimes can be very helpful because, you know, I don't know about you, but I've very often, I'll take on a new client and a coaching client and they'll be like, oh yeah, my my diet's super clean. I'm, I eat a great diet. I'm like, okay, that's awesome. Do something, do me a favor and keep a food diary for a week. Just give me a snapshot of what a week in the life of you looks like. And one of two things happens. They resist it like as if I just asked them to jump into a pit with a bunch of ra- ravenous lions or they come back a week later going, holy crap, I had no idea X, Y, Z. And so I don't know how you feel about this whole space of, I mean, we are now moving a little bit away from the basics, moving into this space of, of tracking, right? And whether it's with a pen and paper or a wearable, like where, where you fall kind of in that, in that world with that, that aspect of, you know, kind of moving along. I'm a big fan of it. And I wear an aura ring. I've worn other tracking devices and I've, measure them side by side. Um, So I've definitely gotten deep into the data over the years. I do think there is a balance element. Mm -hmm. So when I was super sick and overwhelmed, I was keeping spreadsheets of like supplements. I was taking everything that I was doing and I still wasn't getting better until I addressed some of these pillars more deeply and until I addressed my mindset and my emotions. Um, But I became kind of obsessed with 
the data and the supplements and the metrics. And so I think if you're able to do it in a healthy way, it can be really, really helpful. Um, but if you're super overwhelmed, maybe focus on getting good sleep first and then use a wearable to help you, but just focus on sleep yeah. and then add in maybe food tracking, but figure out a way to do it in a way where it's giving you data that's helpful versus data that is sort of deflating or makes you feel guilty or bad because we want to build positive habits and like anywhere we can create positive feedback loops instead of negative ones. That's a great area to focus on. Yeah, no, that's so true. I mean, definitely. I think we've all seen people who who start to dig into the data and, and start to get stressed by it, right? But you brought up something really interesting that I think in many ways, for me, underpins a lot of what we're talking about today, and that's mindset and stress management. Because it is hard to sleep if your mindset and stress management's not in line, it's hard to move. It's hard to, like, it can be paralyzing, right? If you're super stressed or um, or you don't have the right attitude, it gets harder to eat the right things or you can get kind of pulled into this whole emotional eating space. Um, and what was the fourth one? Light, I mean, even light. I mean, you know, anyone, I think people who've been through difficult times in their lives where they've you know, they've struggled emotionally, know intuitively that getting outside sometimes can be the thing that helps you to shift your state, even ever so slightly. And yet when you're in that bad space, sometimes it's hard to get yourself to move out the door. And so maybe you want to talk a little bit about your approach to this whole, because I know this is something you talk about a lot in terms of mindset and, and managing stress, which, you know, it's funny. I find like stress management becomes a little bit of a, of a, um, a flashpoint because people can get really upset about it. They're like, look, I'm super stressed out. Like, I mean, what do you want me to do? And at the same time is how are we able to frame it for people so that it becomes a kindness to yourself as opposed to yet another box to check off on your list? <laughs> That's such a good point. And yeah, it's definitely a balancing game. And I know I felt this shift when I started addressing my mindset and also my emotions. And so it's a whole separate conversation. But I do think if you have major life events that you've interpreted as trauma that are affecting your nervous system on a daily basis, those are worth dealing with and working with experts to deal with. Because I unknowingly had that track running for decades of my life. And it wasn't until I did that that I was able to even shift into parasympathetic enough for all those spreadsheets of things I was doing to work well. So certainly this is a big component. And I, I see what you're saying. A lot of people, and I was there too, feel guilt about their stress, feel guilt about not being able to do all the things they know they should do. And at that point, more information actually can become more stress. And it's sort of a negative feedback loop at that point. Um, but you're right. I think just adding managed stress as a checklist on our to-do list will not probably get us all the way there. <laughs> the good news is all the things that you talk about on your podcast and that so many experts talk about, these things, if we can implement them slowly, sort of help move in the direction of that positive feedback loop and help us to move into making better changes over time. So again, it goes back to don't expect everything to change overnight. But for me, what actually helped the most was journaling more about my mindset and really starting to just pay attention without intention to change it first, but just pay attention to my inner dialogue and the stories that I was telling myself. Because I've heard it explained, you know, we have our physiology. We also have what we would call our mythology, which is the stories we create around it. And often our stories are sort of guiding our human actions and our physiology. And so when my questions and stories were that it was really hard to lose weight and I was sick and I had Hashimoto's and why was it so hard and why can't I lose weight? That's what my subconscious focused on. And I got answers like, because you've had six kids, because you have thyroid disease, because, because, because. When I very slowly through journaling and just, just paying attention to that inner language started to just shift slowly into better questions and statements, I started to get better answers. So when I started to ask myself, how can it be fun to do these things I know I need to do? How can I make it blissful? to sleep enough. How, and it just started, my subconscious started answering better questions. And I also realized in doing that work, and this will be individual for everybody, but when I was able to shift into a mindset of gratitude and appreciation and self-love for this body that had made six kids and that had gotten me to this far in my life, it became much easier to make all the choices I wanted to make from a place of self-love than from a place of guilt. Mm -hmm. Because guilt is not a very good motivator. And self-love is. And then I wasn't trying to punish myself healthy. And I wasn't trying to shame myself then. I was just simply trying to nourish my body. 
mm-hmm. and it responded. And I think it's also a reframe of our language about how we speak about things. Because I used to say, I am sick or I have Hashimoto's. And now I try to be very careful about anything that comes after the words I am or any label that I give myself. Now I view those as words someone else has given me that I get to choose how I respond to. And so I said, I am healing. I am getting better every day. I didn't give myself the labels or the identity of being sick anymore or of having Hashimoto's. And now I don't. My labs are clean. I take no thyroid medication. It was a slow journey. It didn't happen overnight. But I do think the stories we tell ourselves are really powerful. And I think also if we can shift, instead of thinking symptoms, disease, all these things, those are bad. Think of them as they are messengers. And if we reframe in gratitude, they are gifts. Because it's actually our body speaking loudly enough that we can hear it. And maybe our body whispered to us for a long time, we missed it. And now our body's speaking loudly. So if we can use that to find what does my body either need that it doesn't have or have too much of that it doesn't need, there's where we get the best data about our own bodies and become our own healers and our own primary health care providers. And that's when those things become lasting habits instead of willpower or guilt-driven decisions that we think we should make. Yeah. No, I love everything that you just said. It's so true. Another thing that I recently heard from someone in that same vein is I get to, like I get to exercise or I get to choose the right foods for myself, or I get to eat these delicious foods that nourish my body. It's, it's, it's really shifting from obligation, guilt, um, and as you say, strong arming yourself into, you know, this whole attitude of willpower and it's so hard and it's so much work to do this and look, it, which is not to diminish, but I think part of that piece is it is hard to do 500 different new things at once. It can, it can be a lot easier on you if you choose the one thing that you're going to start with today. And you know what? I could sit here and say, oh, the most important thing is this. How about we pick the thing that you think you can be successful at most easily will be the best thing for you to start with today and kind That's of a great ease point. into the next one. Yeah. Because I think and, and even as coaches, we, we kind of say, oh, well, if you're not doing this, then nothing else is going to happen. And you know, you've got this poor person in front of you and that's the one thing they really can't do or it's the one thing that is escaping them. And if we if we actually tie and kind of take the pressure off that part and support them in, in, in asking, you know, what is the one thing you think you can, like, it's a little bit like dealing with the toddler, right? Like, instead of saying, you need to do this now, um, are you open to doing, will you do this, this, or this? Or do you want to eat this, this, or that? And And allowing, giving us agency to kind of, intuitively or instinctively choose that first step that we think we're even going to be able to be successful at. Um, but I wanted to actually ask you another question that came to me earlier and then I lost it and then I wrote it down. Um, and again, like we get people coming to us and I just came across someone like this recently who listed a blinding number of supplements and practices that they're doing. And they're in a really tough spot right now, right? Like they're, they're throwing everything at it. Um, How do we help? How do you help? Or how, what's your advice for people to sometimes say, let's just strip it down. Let's just stop. I mean, I know there's a good reason for all the things that you're doing. What if we just released all that temporarily? You don't have to throw everything away. (laughs) Like what if, (laughs) Um, what's your kind of process around that or your advice to people in this space where, you know, they've been listening to all the podcasts and they've been consuming all this information and they turn around and now they have a, not a cupboard, not a drawer, but a pantry full of stuff. How do we help people to kind of strip it down again and then maybe reintroduce different things at different times? That's a great question. And I've been there too with a pantry full of supplements and all of the food restrictions and all of those things and all the stress that came with it. And I would know from being there, the fear that would have come with like the idea of letting all of that go. Mm -hmm. And I think A, that the conversation of letting go and how beneficial that can be is its own whole conversation. But I had an expert on my podcast recently who that is a huge part of her approach. And she sees people reverse chronic migraines that don't respond to medication through a process of letting go because there is an element of that emotional connection. Um, But I think it becomes a conversation of what if we didn't, like you said, didn't get rid of those things. 
But what if we simplify down to baby steps? And if it helps, you can give yourself a list of the baby steps you're going to add back in when they don't feel stressful. But when we realize that stress and fear and guilt actually can make all of these things we're trying to do less effective anyway, like Mm -hmm. what if we make that the variable? What if we make that the variable of how could I let go of some stress? How could I simplify some things? Because yes, we're made to do hard things and not everything has to be hard. And so what if we took sort of a mindset approach first and looked at, okay, what are the things that you're doing that help your stress to go down, that feel good, that you enjoy, that you love? Let's keep those for now. And then how can we build more of those variables into your life and let go of the ones that seem to be related to stress for you for now? And that might change. And one day it might be easy and blissful and fun to do all of those same things. And maybe one day you won't need all of those things. Because at the end of the day, what I remind people as well is our body is designed to heal. That's the state it wants to naturally move to is perfect health always. And I know when I had autoimmune disease, I would sometimes say things like my body is attacking myself. And I had Mm -hmm. to learn to rewrite that statement. Because if our bodies wanted to attack us, we would be dead in under a second. It would not take a whole second for our bodies to kill us. Our bodies are always on our side. And they're often giving us really powerful messages of what they need. So all these people who have listened to all the experts and all the podcasts, and me included, you can gain wisdom from that. And have you listened to yourself? Have you listened to this quiet voice within you? Have you listened to the signs your body's giving you? Because no expert can tell you what your body is trying to tell you. But it can. And so maybe start there and ask it and figure out slowly what are the things that are most supportive to me right now. And yes, they can all change, but start there. And then when you have the energy, build from there. But don't feel like you have to do everything that every expert does and that that's going to just magically reduce your stress level and cure all these things overnight because you're probably just going to keep your stress there. Yeah. And I, you know, when you say that, I think one thing that um, maybe escapes people is all the experts all have their issues. Um, I think everybody has their struggles. Everybody has their little sticking points that that they're working on. And sometimes maybe we're not as good at, I mean, you're really good at explaining to people and letting people in to a degree where it's appropriate on what you're going through. Um, but I do think that as you know, perceived experts in a field, it's important for the experts and then even people like us who give voice to a lot of this stuff. And from the outside, it looks like, oh my God, you know, she must like have this perfect diet and do this perfect thing. And basically share with people that, you know, like everybody else, we're, our, stick, our sticking points might be different, but we're all a bit of a work in progress. And we're all kind of working through this crazy human experience like everybody else. So we're all kind of in this together. So I wanted to ch- change speeds a little bit because we had a little conversation before we started. Um, because as we, as you know, I mean, a lot of what I do kind of focus on in the podcast is this whole concept of longevity and health span. So how are we, how can we live our lives today? And sometimes we have to remember and enjoy our lives today and keep that going for many decades to come so that we live a long and, and, and productive and fruitful and fulfilling life for as long as possible. And um, we got onto this whole topic of blue zones. And I know that the blue zones are, I mean, you you know, on paper, they shouldn't be, but yet they're a very controversial topic because you've got some people who, you know, I've got, I've had friends who've come to me and said, oh my God, I just read this book or I just watched this documentary on the blue zones. Holy jumping, completely changing my life. And now I must do ABCD. And I kind of try really hard not to roll my eyes and say, well, you know, kind of have to be careful of the filter that people put on. So, and and I would think that your background as a journalist gives you a unique skill set to kind of look at something like the Blue Zones and the sound bites that are coming to us from whatever it is that people are communicating versus what really, what the data really says. And so I'd love it if you would be willing to unpack a little bit of this, you know, some of the mythology and some of the reality around the Blue Zones for for the audience. I'm so glad you brought this up. I love this topic because it's an area that sort of along with oral health, I've had a fascination about for almost 15 years. And like you said, we see headlines often about the blue zones. And if we just read the headlines, we're going to get a whole lot of really confusing, conflicting messages that are not what the data actually says. And so I had that same experience. I've read those books. I've seen those experts. And 
what I noticed was there would be two completely contradictory viewpoints, and they were both trying to use the same blue zone data to justify their viewpoint. And of course, this happens across the board, not just in the health space, people using confirmation bias and cherry pick data to support what they want to say. But when you actually look at it, some really fascinating things emerge. And I'm, of course, just a human looking at this data as well. But they've also now had AI analyze this data. And it's really interesting when you actually strip down to the data what you find. Because we've perhaps all seen the headlines that it's red wine. It's not. That it's a vegetarian diet. It's not. That it's there's a whole host of because they eat olives, because they eat this. And actually, none of those things are consistent across all the blue zones. There are things like, look at where they are geographically. None of them are in Antarctica or at the North Pole. So there is an element of light, like we talked about earlier, and how much sun they can get. And we know the effects that has on mitochondria, which is also tied to longevity. So there are some commonalities we can pull out. But that's where it gets interesting. There is not one single diet across all the blue zones that is the same. Even though a lot of people try to use this to justify their particular diet, they don't all drink or not drink wine. Mm -hmm. They do all move, but differently. The probably strongest statistical commonality is the strength of their community and relationships. So if you wanted to pull one takeaway from the blue zone, that's where I would actually start. But as an example of some fascinating things that data actually says, and an example, I'll give you my own in sort of cherry picking if you wanted to show a particular thing, I'll illustrate this one point. So if you look at the data, in most of the blue zones, it's actually the men who are living longer, and that's what accounts for the difference. We know that women statistically, on average, live longer anyway. And when we look at the data, why is that? What are the men doing differently? In several of these places, ironically, the men smoke. They are consuming a lot of nicotine, nicotinamide. They are also consuming it with things like sheep dairy. And there's a very interesting biochemical reaction when those things happen together in the body. We hear a lot of experts talking about taking things like NMN or all these fancy supplements. They're essentially creating that through a mixture of dietary things and smoking. So if you wanted to, if a person wanted to, they could make an argument that smoking is beneficial based on blue zone data. Again, <laughs> to illustrate why we don't want to cherry pick the data. That's what I mean by going back to the data. And that can illustrate things like, oh, so maybe the core building blocks of that, maybe some of those key components are things we could focus on when we're exploring the blue zone data and how that can work where we live and with our light exposure and with our diet. Not that we all need to smoke, of course. I'm definitely not saying that on this podcast. No. But it, just to illustrate what we mean, it's like if you actually look at the data of blue zones, one could make an argument that smoking is linked to longevity based on the actual data. And people cherry pick like that all the time. But the strongest statistical correlations that we see in the data are kind of go back to those pillars, nutrient density and food, exposure to natural light, movement. A lot of them walk uphill or have some kind of zone two walking built into their life and then very strongly community. Yeah. And I think if you had to isolate down to a single variable, community would actually emerge as the most strong connection there. A hundred percent. I'm I'm so glad you said that. And I'm so glad you brought up well, I mean, the the smoking thing is hilarious. Like when you said it before the podcast, I'm like, oh, we need to talk about this, <laughs> right? Um, because it's it's so con it's so contradictory to everything. But at the same time, you will never find a blue zone in a city. Like it's just not going to happen. And in cities, I think not only do we end up getting exposed to a lot of toxins, but like, you know, in the air that we breathe in the whole nine yards, community can be, it not necessarily, it depends on the person, but community can be incredibly elusive when you live in a big, crazy city, living a big, crazy life with too much going on and, you know, just trying to keep up, trying to pay the rent, feed your kids, deal with all the stuff. Um, and, and it's interesting also that that community piece underpins the blue zone data for longevity because, and this is going to seem unrelated, but I find it interesting that there's a book, um, written by a researcher called radical remission. And it actually is a book about cancer, but it's about people who healed from cancer in spite of having been given a death, you know, not a dense, but basically having been given a diagnosis from a doctor that says, you know, you have a limited time on this earth, get your affairs in order. And yet these people live. And this researcher kind of tried to nail down what are the key components? What are the commonalities that unite these people? Like, is it a medication that they took? Is it a supplement? Is it a this? Is it a that? And the things that really stayed with me from those nine things were community. They all had exceptional support systems around them and getting rid of toxic jobs, toxic 
people in their lives, toxic relationships. And I just find that to find those things in a list of people who against all odds survived something that we consider as deadly as cancer, and then looking at blue zones and looking at longevity in blue zones, and then finding those things in there again. And and of course they cleaned up their diet and, and all the things, but I just think it speaks so powerfully to that human need for connection that, and, and you know, if the last three or four years has taught us anything, if we look at the impact of children not, not being able to go to school or people not being able to be in person in community with each other and the impact that's had on so, on mental health and people's health, I think that that message, it just keeps, you know, the universe kind of keeps trying to deliver it in many different ways and we need to listen. <laughs> that's such a good point and yeah it kind of circles back to the beginning of the conversation with you're right about the blue zones they're not in big metropolitan areas we possibly all have a nature deficit disorder mm -hmm. what if part of the answer is just living as close to nature as possible even if we're doing it in our homes and how we set them up and also i'm really curious to read that radical remission book but i think the nervous system component of that we didn't really go deep on that today mm -hmm. but the nervous system often needs us to do less, not more. And we live in a society of doing more constantly. And so even if you're still going to do the same number of things, figuring out a system within your own life where you can do those with less stress, where you can simplify, where you can not feel that overwhelm all the time, because I haven't gotten to go to the blue zones, but I would guess if we interviewed those people, they would not be rushing around urgently trying to get to all of these activities all the time. They probably operate at a much calmer nervous system state and I know there's a lot of data coming out about the nervous system and what those statistics look like in society, but I think that's probably another commonality that hasn't really been as deeply studied, but that mm -hmm. perhaps was also present in that radical remission book. Yeah. Well, this whole idea of being in a perpetual sympathetic state where the sympathetic arm of your nervous system is overactivated, which is ultimately, it's. I mean, look, it's going to affect everything. It's going to affect your sleep. It's going to affect your digestion, your ability to absorb the nutrients from your food. It's, you know, it's going to affect your ability to regulate so that stressful, you know, the stressful things that happen, which will happen regardless, it's, and you mentioned it earlier in passing, is how is it going to affect you? Are you able to buffer those things? Because we can't stop the stress, but can we address our response to the stress in, in a different way so it doesn't affect us in the same way? Um, I don't think, no, not, it's not going to affect light. Light's still going to be light. <laughs> <laughs> but but certainly that whole being in a sympathetic dominant state um, will ultimately be another, it, well, it's part of the mindset and stress management piece is going to really kind of skew your system in a certain way. Um, and I think in those blue zones, to your point, and and probably nobody's really studied it, but if you if you read between the lines about the lifestyle of these people, it doesn't, it sure doesn't sound like you've got too much rushing woman syndrome going around over there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so Katie, as we kind of, you know, wind down this episode, which I think again, like I'm going to go back to the beginning, what I said at the beginning, I think hopefully the way, the way I feel about this, this conversation is it's just like a, a refreshing glass of water. It's it's a pause in this craziness of our biohacking and and health optimization world. You know what? How do we? How do you help people? Or what advice would you kind of give people? Just to kind of help them to take a step back, right? From because we we can be convinced that I must do this. I must have that. And maybe you do. Right. And so, you know, is there a process maybe we can offer people to help them to take an inventory of what it is that that's tying them up in their life and how to maybe under, get, gain some clarity around what are the things you might be able to release and what are the things that you might really need to kind of lean into um, from your point of view? And um, yeah, maybe just some parting words for people. Oh, that's such a good question. I think I might go back to the mindset side on this a little bit more. Um, I would say, pay attention to your inner story about it. And anytime you see words like I am or should, 
pay a special attention to those because if you can shift from a place of judgment to a place of curiosity about those things, you might start getting better answers without having to turn to expensive tests or experts. If you have the resources to do those things, data can be really helpful. I find like my kids who are athletes keep a journal of when they pole vault their height, their grip, their pole, all these things. I find for many of us, just keeping a journal of some metrics around your day, your sleep, what you ate, if it's not stressful for you, how you felt, if you got sunlight, just some basic things will help you start to see patterns and your own patterns are going to be much more effective than other people's patterns. And I think the stress one and the nervous system key might be a great starting point before you Mm -hmm. get into all the more complicated things. And that can be as simple as making five minutes a couple times a day to slowly breathe in and out through your nose. Try to breathe Mm -hmm. in as slowly as possible and out as slowly as possible. Try to just nurture ways to get into parasympathetic more often. And then also from that perspective of the stories we create about things, I find that most of our stress actually doesn't live in the present moment. Most of our stress comes from past or more often from the future, which is sort of our imagination going wild in the form of worry. But stress doesn't often live in the present moment. And so if you can find ways to put little reminders to yourself to just be in the present moment and to breathe and to let go of the things that are not of the present moment, you might find you start to get a little more clarity. I actually have like a tiny um, dot tattooed on my hand that represents a period, which is a reminder to myself to be in the present moment and to do everything as if it were the last time I ever got to do it. Mm. And I find that when I think of it, I'm so much calmer in the present moment because I save for it. And I think those things seem inconsequential and across the board in health, we often underestimate the simple things because of their simplicity. But those little shifts might help you to shift into a better nervous system state and also into a better mindset to actually start to figure out for you specifically what your answers are. I love that. And the whole idea of your period, you know, being in the present, being present in this moment um, and not worrying so much about the future or ruminating on the past, I think is so so powerful, right? And it's powerful for our quality of life and our quality of relationships, which kind of goes full circle. So we didn't get to talk about um, the wellness products because I you do like for some, you know, that you, you kind of pick this little niche um, of oral health, which is so interesting because so many people have so many big obsessions, but, you know, oral health is often the unsung hero of of wellness, Um, wellness being the operative word. Um, But maybe um, as we close, you can tell people like where they can find you a little bit about the work that you do. We'll talk to them a bit about your podcast because you've got an amazing podcast. Um, And then these, the, you know, the wellness brand that is a beautiful thing. Oh, thank you. Well, all of my blog posts and podcast and all of those resources live at wellnessmama.com. And you can find me on social media by the same name. Um, wellness was really a passion project that I've had sort of a weird obsession with oral health for years after I had several cavities and they found them right before I got pregnant. And I didn't want to fill them while I was pregnant. And during that pregnancy, we moved to a different state. So after I went to the dentist thinking I needed to have these cavities filled and they said I didn't have any which was new information to me because I didn't realize cavities could heal. That's certainly not what we're told. And so it led to this whole research about this really fascinating science of the oral microbiome and of remineralization and the fact that the body actually, like everywhere else, is designed to heal, especially if it hasn't advanced to the point where you have really deep cavities. The mouth knows how to remineralize if it's given the right building blocks. And so after that, I actually started making my own toothpaste because I couldn't find one that had all the things I wanted in it to keep continuing that process. And then eventually realized uh, wellness was born out of realizing that I had so many friends and even family members that ate really clean, bought organic food, but there were still a few products they were using that were filled with all kinds of nasty stuff. And it's because those things worked. And I realize women especially don't want to trade how they look or how their teeth feel or having white teeth for using a natural product. And that's the areas where they'll still choose the conventional one. So I realize in order for that to change, we need natural products that outperform the conventional ones. And so that's where all the basis for wellness was. And I thought with the skin being such a large organ and the mouth being so intricately connected to all of our body, to me, having non-toxic ingredients should be the absolute minimum. Like that should be the standard across the board. And unfortunately it's not. But knowing that, that means we can also use that to our advantage and put beneficial things in what go on our skin or in our mouth. So that was kind of the impetus for wellness. And that lives at wellness.com, which is wellness with an E on the end. 
Beautiful. I love it. Katie, thank you so much for today. Um, I'm so glad we got this in and I'm so glad to have met you in person and I'm looking forward to when our paths cross again. Me too. Thank you so much for having me. You're a phenomenal interviewer and this was a lot of fun. I'm learning from the best. Thanks so much. <laughs>